Thanks so much for joining me on the Slice of Healthcare podcast. How are you today? I'm great, Jared. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. I'm excited for us to chat. It's, it's quite the honor. Thank you so much for, for agreeing to, to be a guest. And um, I'm excited to, to learn more about your background. I, I've already obviously read and, and know a lot about you from there's plenty of sources on the internet for that, but I, I like to hear it from the source. So I'd love if you could tell the audience a little bit about your background. Sure. Well, um, I got introduced to telemedicine way back in 1967 um, when there was no internet. Uh, our telecommunications infrastructures were quite um, ancient, so to speak. Um, I was a resident in medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. And in those days, there was no specialty in emergency medicine. So the medical senior resident and the surgical senior resident took 12-hour shifts running the emergency department. Uh, this particular summer day, late summer, and believe it or not, 1967, um, I was standing out in front of the ER waiting for the typical Boston traffic accident victim to be rolled in um, when all of a sudden the ER doors swung open and standing in the middle of those doors was my professor of medicine, Dr. Kenneth Bird. And there's a specific reason I'm mentioning his name because um, while I am mischaracterized as the father of telemedicine, the real father of telemedicine is Dr. Kenneth Bird, and let me tell you why. He was standing there in the middle of the door. He was sweating, his face was red, and he was very upset, and I knew exactly why. Because Dr. Bird, as professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School in 1967, was making a grand total of $8,000 a year. So he was moonlighting. And what was he moonlighting as? He was moonlighting as the medical director at Logan Airport Medical Station. Now, if you live in Boston, you know that the MGH is only two and a half miles away from Logan Airport. But in 1967, there was only a single tunnel going under the Charles River to the airport. And the traffic was backed up for miles on both sides and it used to take him an hour each way to go two and a half miles. To make a long story short, he started walking towards me and I knew, I knew he was upset. And he grabbed my arm and he said, Jay, and I stopped him. I said, I know Dr. Bird, I know you got caught in the traffic again. He said, yes. He said, but I had this idea. What do you think about it? What if I buy two TV cameras? And in those days there was no color black and white TV cameras. What if I buy two T TV cameras, put one here at the MGH, one at Logan Airport, and I began to examine patients over TV? What do you think? Now, remember, I was a resident. He was my professor. I thought it was the stupidest idea I'd ever heard of in my life. But I had enough common sense to say, gee, Dr. Bird, that's a very interesting idea. And I've been doing telemedicine ever since. As a matter of fact, the name telemedicine um, came about because uh, Dr. Bird uh, said, listen, we can't call it television medicine. Let's call it telemedicine. Um, 1973, fast forward, uh, I was assistant chief of medicine at the University of Miami School of Medicine, Jackson Memorial Hospital. I received a National Science Foundation grant to study telemedicine. We did a three-year study, proved its effectiveness from a quality standpoint, an economic standpoint, a psychological standpoint, and a technological uh, standpoint. And then, except for, we finished this in 1976, except for three world leaders at the time, I could not get anybody interested in telemedicine for the next 15 years. I know we don't have time, but I ought to mention the three world leaders. One was the Shah of Iran, who I met with um, in Tehran. And the other two were President and Mrs. Marcos of the Philippines, who I met with in Manila, both of whom uh, 
all three of them wanted telemedicine for their country. Um, but I was not a business person. I was an academician. I still view myself as that. Um, and most of their basic healthcare problems related to sanitary water and food, their population. And I suggested they initially spend their money on those basic necessities rather than telemedicine. It wasn't until 1991 when the governor of Georgia, Governor Zell Miller, called me and asked me to set up a statewide telemedicine system for Georgia. And why? Um, when he introduced himself to me, he said, uh, Jay, I'm the governor of two states. And I looked at him somewhat quizzically and I said, excuse me, governor? He said, yes, I'm the governor of Atlanta and I'm the governor of the rest of Georgia. He said, the rest of Georgia is very rural. We have rural hospitals. We don't have access to specialists. The best census of these rural hospitals is going down. Many of them are closing. And he said what a lot of people don't understand, and he taught me economics 101, which they never taught me in medical school. And that is that the major employer in many of these rural hospitals, in these rural communities, is the rural hospital. The rural hospital goes under within a three to five year period of time, the entire socioeconomic fabric of that community goes under. Okay, so now let me fast forward. 1991 to 1993, I set up a um, 59 site telemedicine network throughout the state of Georgia. The state of California, the state of Arizona came, they set up the same model type of system subsequent to this, that became the model for the rest of the states in the United States. 1993, I received an earmark from the federal government and from the Department of Defense, because I wanted to demonstrate that examining a patient in their home was much better than subsequently evaluating them in extremists in the hospital emergency department. If I could examine them in their home, I might be able to avoid that hospitalization. So we started um, the first telehome care technology in 93, and I also started the American Telemedicine Association uh, that same year. Um, fast forward, uh, NASA uh, developing, helping them develop a healthcare delivery system for the trip to Mars. Um, under the Clinton administration, I represented the United States for the G8 nations for telemedicine. Um, and in 1996, uh, under a NASA grant, I developed the first um, healthcare uh, kiosk. Thank you for that. Uh, I want to. I'd, I'd like to call it, you know, I guess a, a timeline throughout the history. And you must, part of you must love it, and part of you must also be frustrated when you see how. Ex well, you're excited that the acceptance of telehealth is at the level it is today, but then you have that knowledge of how difficult it was back then and how people probably looked at you like you were crazy for, for a while, right? Well, that's, that's the problem with the healthcare delivery system. It's not just me. One of the problems is that we have great science, but we have, we have a totally archaic delivery system. Um, and I'm not just meaning telemedicine because remember, with respect to telemedicine, the most important thing about telemedicine has nothing to do with how rapidly we send the message, uh, whether we're doing it on our smartphone, whether we're doing over a Zoom uh, meeting um, such as this, whether we do it by satellite. The most important part of telemedicine is the message. If I send the wrong consultative note um, to that patient, to that primary care physician, that's not good. <laughs> I don't care how quickly and how effectively with what wonderful technology I'm using, telemedicine is potentially dangerous to your health if the knowledge base of the consultant is not up to date. And, and let me just flip the coin a second. Um, there is no physician, I don't care how good that physician is, who can keep up to date today. The good news is we have so much great science the bad news is nobody can keep up to date with it. And that's why we need to begin to marry AI 
and medical sensors with telemedicine. And, and, and let, me, let, let me mention something about medical sensors and how archaic our healthcare delivery system is. You and I will get into our car and turn on the ignition and what happens? The dashboard lights up. We know everything about that car's running. We know the gas level, we know the temperature, um, we know the oil pressure, we know which tire is losing pressure. We know when we're supposed to bring it in for service. There's only one thing in that car we know nothing about. That's the driver. Just think about this um, from a sensor standpoint. If I sit in my seat, I can get my weight. If I put my hands on the steering wheel, I can get a rhythm strip, an EKG, and a, a RR variability. If I take my seat belt and I plug it in, I've got my respiratory rate, my respiratory volume, and with some neat signal processing, I can get mean arterial blood pressure. I've got an OnStar system that can connect all my vital signs to what my normal vital sign should be in the cloud. Why in the world aren't we doing that? Let's, let's reverse it. What happens if you went to the dealership, you bought a new car, and you turned on the ignition and nothing happened? You don't know what your gas level is. You don't know what your oil pressure is. You don't know what the temperature is. And the dealer says, okay, bring it in once a year for a checkup without knowing anything about it. That is the classic example of our healthcare delivery system. Come in once a year for your yearly checkup. That is the most ridiculous thing in the world. And it's because this is ridiculous that, uh, just to, to let everyone know, right, you're, you're involved with, uh, who was just a guest, Michael Gorton and Recuro Health, which is really what you're aiming at, at fixing, right? 100%. Um, putting in these kind of uh, sensors, making the home the exam room. The exam room needs to be where the patient lives, not where the doctor works. Um, in the same way, when I walk into my home, I know the temperature, I know the radon um, level. Um, I have a carbon monoxide uh, sensor. I have a fire sensor. Once again, the only thing I know nothing about in my home is myself. We need to change that. And we need to add another level of technology, of science. We need to know what your genetic background is. We have this ridiculous system where we say, oh, everybody's blood pressure needs to be below 120 over 80. That's the most ridiculous thing in the world. Um, most women's blood pressure are lower than most men's. That's why they live longer uh, than we do. Um, so my wife, as an example, her normal blood pressure is 90 over 60. If she goes next year for her ridiculous annual physical exam, and her blood pressure is 100 over 70, guess what? Her physician's gonna say, gee, Mrs. Sanders, your blood pressure's perfectly normal. It's not, it's elevated. Um, so the genetics will give us specificity. It will give us precision medicine. And what Mercuro Health is looking at is the exam room being where the patient is, where the patient works, and assessing that individual based upon their genetic background, on AI, and on sensors. Interesting. Yeah, it, it was, it was uh, really great to have Michael on the podcast to, for like the first time, right, to, to talk in an audio format about what you're building over there at Recuro Health. And I like the team that you're putting together to, to kick things off. And I have no doubt it'll be successful, just like uh, Teladoc was and is. Um, I'd, I'd quickly like to kind of hear your, what, 
What are some of the things you're, that you can share that you're most excited about as it relates to Recuro Health? Um, I know Michael mentioned a few things, but it's always interesting to, to ask guests, right, what they're excited about in terms of what they're building. Well, I think um, number one, we, we have the capability to provide that complete healthcare delivery system that both Michael and I described, and that is uh, provide precision medicine uh, to focus in on the specific patient, on examining them in their environment, not in the physician's uh, environment, um, to connect their um, genetic analysis um, with what their real world physiological parameters are, and to be much more specific with respect to recommendations as to the type of medication, lifestyle um, they should be following. Um, we'll have a much better way of keeping patients um, healthier. And quite candidly, and here I may be going way off the scale, um, but it's something that we've got a lot, a lot of scientific data for now um, to enhance longevity. I love it. I love it. Well, I'm, I'm so happy that you were able to come on the podcast to give your story, to talk about Recuro Health and talk about some of the things you're really excited about for both Recuro Health, but the future of healthcare in, in general. So thank you again so much for being a guest and hopefully we can have you on again. Maybe we'll have you and Michael on at the same time and we can stir the pot too. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's uh, it was we great. We better not sing. <laughs> We do whatever you want. If you, we want to, we can say, we can do whatever. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you again so much for being a guest and uh, all the best of luck to, to what you're building at Recurro Health. Thank you very much, Jared.